you. So um, when I was a student, I always tended to get frustrated with uh, when I would go to the start of a new course um, and the professor would spend waste time on telling me what the course was about, what it was going to teach me, and all the administrative details. Um, from my perspective, you know, the ideal math course, the first sentence out of the professor's mouth should always be, let E be elliptic, an elliptic curve, and then he should just go from there. Um, so I'm, but I'm going to do the th exactly the thing that I used to uh, get annoyed by and spend probably the, good, the first 20 minutes of this lecture um, just introducing the course, telling you things that you need to know in order to really get the most out. Out of it. Um, so the goal, the, the goal of this course is to introduce you to uh, a number of uh, selected computational tools that I hope will be useful to you in your research, um, both in the uh, years and decades ahead, but in particular over the course of the next three weeks. So the part of the purpose of this, car, of this course is to help equip you to get more out of the other courses and other parts of the research program or whatever mathematics you plan to do here. Um, and so I'm very grateful to uh, Hendrik Lenstra who agreed to swap weeks with me so that I could, we could do this uh, course in the first week. And maybe to set the stage, I wanted to just have you do a little bit of a thought experiment. Um, this will be not so much of an experiment. This will be very easy for some of the old timers uh, in the audience like me and, and me. But I want you to imagine yourself back in time when things like... Google and Wikipedia and Archive, Math Signet wasn't online. Um, when the, the internet as we know it was not readily available and you didn't have an entire universe of mathematics at your fingertips. Um, if you wanted to know a theorem or to know if anybody had proved a particular theorem, your best choice was to go down to the library and look for it. And if you happen to be lucky enough to have a very good library, maybe you could find it, or maybe not, and you'd spend a lot of time proving a theorem that someone else had already proved, or you'd spend a lot of time struggling with some substep of the big theorem you wanted to prove, not realizing that that substep had already been completed by somebody else and you could have saved yourself a lot of time and effort. Um, but there was a time when that was how mathematics was done, and it was a lot more it was a lot more work. And if we wanted to write a paper, we had to actually type it up. And if we made a mistake, we had to get out the whiteout and, and put out the whiteout. So the, the point I'm making is that there are computational tools available that all of you use every day that you take completely for granted, just like eating, drinking, breathing. You don't even think about it. But just imagine if you couldn't instantly um, Google whatever you wanted to, or you know, have your your phone, your laptop, whatever, with you at all times, helping you not just in your daily life, but helping you to do math. So I hope you'll all agree that the world is a better place and mathematics is a better place today for the availability of these wonderful tools. And I want to imagine you now, have you now imagine going forward in the future, say another 30, 40 years. I hope it won't take that long. Um, I hope there will come a time when it's just as hard to imagine not having immediate access to computational tools that allow you to sort of instantaneously visualize, play with, experiment with the mathematical ideas that are going, going on inside your head. Um, personally for me, you know, when, I'm, when I get up in the morning and I'm having my morning coffee and eating my breakfast, I'm reading through the latest archive postings, and I almost can't imagine, you know, looking through these things without having a computer at my side and a computer algebra system that I can immediately jump into and try out an example or say, oh, I don't think that looks quite right, or really? Is that really true? And then I will go and try and experiment and see it. I realize not everybody does that mathematics that way, but I want to sort of introduce you um, to this sort of experimental computational lens on mathematics that I think can add a lot of value. One of the major stumbling blocks, though, is, is, is not always so easy to use. There are a lot of hurdles and barriers to entry, and a lot of people get frustrated in their first encounter with a computer algebra system, or they think, oh, this is just too complicated, or the computer's too fussy about the syntax, and they get put off by that. And that's a, that's a fair reaction. The tools are not as good as they could be. Um, there are lots of people, including many people in this room, who are working on making them better. Um, but, you know, it's, it's reasonable to, to have that perspective, but I hope, or my goal for this week is to try and get as many of you, you as I can sort of over that hurdle and to the point where you feel that your, your personal cost-benefit analysis is that yes, um, even though this tool is imperfect, it's giving me more than I'm putting into it and it's worth using on a daily basis. Okay, so that's, that's our goal. Um, 
for this week. Yeah, that's sort of the primary goal. And then sort of my secondary goal is to secretly convert you all into computational number theorists so that you'll help us make these tools better for the generations of mathematicians that come after us. Now it seems uh, at this point uh, sort of an appropriate point for me to acknowledge the uh, support of the Simons Foundation, uh, which funds not just my research, but the uh, entire Simons collaboration in arithmetic geometry, number theory, and computation, um, which is very well represented um, at this uh, event. I think there are, there are at least uh, a dozen of us here. Um, this includes uh, researchers at MIT, Harvard, BU, uh, Dartmouth, and Brown. Um, and sort of our foundational philosophy is uh, exploiting uh, and studying this interplay between theory and computation. There are a lot of times when theoretical questions or conjectures motivate uh, computations, but there are also situations where computations motivate new theoretical developments, some of which can be uh, quite, um, quite wide-ranging. I think maybe the best example of that is the Birch and Swinerton Dyer conjecture, which has led to you know, a phenomenal amount of new mathematics that is still going on today, largely driven by computational experiments and op op observations that were made um, by Birch and Swinerton Dyer um, more than 50 years ago now. So these tools are going to allow you to be the next Birch and Swinerton Dyer. I know that we have a lot of ringers in the audience. I asked you, all, as many, many of you have already filled out the survey where I asked, for, for, asked to get a picture of what sort of background or experience you might have had with existing computational tools. Um, but we're gonna be looking at four different systems. And I think exactly one person um, claimed to have at least used all four of those systems more than once. So for everybody here, I think there's at least something that's going to be really new. And I would encourage those who have a lot of experience in one particular system to view this week as an opportunity to, to try out a different system. Maybe you'll go back to the one you love the most that's your favorite, that's fine, but I think there's a lot to be gained by just trying out some different tools, seeing what they can do. It also, it's kind of like studying a foreign language. It teaches you not just something about a foreign language, but you also appreciate your own language better when you have something to compare it to. Okay, and then the final thing I want to emphasize is that this course is really all about the problem sessions. Um, the lectures are really just to set the stage, introduce you to the, you know, the actors on that stage, but um, all, of, all of the real uh, progress and action in this course is gonna be happening during the problem sessions. And in order to make those um, effective, there's a few things that you need to know and you need to do to prepare for them. Thankfully, many of you have already done them, and I'm, I'm very grateful for those efforts. Um, the first thing I'll note is, especially for the people in the back who maybe have a hard time reading these slides, these slides that I'm showing you are available to you. Um, you can all follow along on your own computers and I invite you to do so. If you've already set up an account on our notebook server, if you go to um, pcmi2022.org and log in and go to the course folder and click on lecture1.md, you'll see exactly the slides that I'm showing and you can scroll through them at your leisure. For those of you who haven't already done that, um, there's a sequence of steps that you need to go through that I've um, shown here. I won't run through them in detail, but the sort of the, the, I guess the, the basic point is that we are um, using GitHub as a third-party authorization tool that's going to allow you to uh, log into our notebook server without us having to create a separate account and set up a con con credentials for you, and that makes everybody's life a lot simpler. Um, I know there's, there's a lot of us here. We've got a big machine running. It's, it's running 128 cores. It's got almost a terabyte of memory. Everybody is invited and welcome to use it. I'm, I'm pretty confident it can, it can handle the load. Um, and here again, I should thank the Simons Foundation who is funding that uh, computation, the, the computational resources that we're using for this course. Um, if you're having follow, you don't need to write down or read all these instructions. If you, if you don't already have access to them, you can find everything here in a document with links you can click on at this address, tinyurl.com 5B3S453S. And the reason I'm spending the time on this is that in order for you to participate in the first problem session, you have to have done this. You won't be able to do anything if you haven't. 
So anyone who's planning to participate in the problem session needs to go through this exercise. I noticed that there were about 10 people who had, ex who had done some of the steps, but not all of them. You'd created your uh, 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 GitHub account and accepted the invitation to join the organization, but hadn't made your membership public. And without doing that, you won't be able to log in because our notebook server, when it goes to GitHub to ask who you are, GitHub will say, never heard of this person. I'm not telling you anything about them because you haven't made your membership public. Okay, so just, that's sort of the, um, administrative background out of the way but the so this seems like a hassle but by getting all of this done today it's great because you don't have to install any software on your laptops we don't have to spend any any time dealing with those kind of setup issues as long as you have a reasonably modern browser you should be able to use all of the tools um, that we've set up for you and here I should acknowledge uh, my course assistant Edgar Costa who is responsible for creating pretty much everything that I'm going to be uh, showing you today on our notebook server I'm very grateful uh, for his, his efforts and you're going to get an opportunity to use some brand new um, you know alpha version software that uh, will allow you to do things that were not previously possible um, but one thing that goes along with using sort of cutting edge uh, software is um, you know things can happen they won't always work perfectly the good news is we've built in a, a lot of reliability if you ever find yourself in a situation where a notebook is not uh, uh, behaving the way you think it should the best thing to do is to restart your kernel and try Try again, and generally you can always recover from from problems that way. Okay. Any questions on what I've said so far? So this is just the setup portion, but I wanted to get this out of the way so that those of you who haven't completed these steps can sort of scurry and do that in the background while I'm talking for the rest of the, the lecture if you need to. Yeah, question. Once you make your membership public, where like where do you get the invitation? Is that one? Yeah. yeah. So that will become, you will get an email from Edgar who is monitoring the, spread, the Google spreadsheet that you're filling, where you're filling out the form. And so anybody new who shows up will be sent an invitation to join the PCMI organization and an invitation to join our ZULIP. And I should say, you don't have to be a student in the graduate summer school program to do this. Everybody is welcome. Anyone who's in this room who wants to join in is welcome to do so. Um, and even if you have activities planned during the problem sessions, you don't have to actually do the problems during the problem session. They're available on the notebook server 24 7 you can do them whenever you like to it's kind of fun to do, do them in a group with other people um, so I mean I encourage you to work you know to work together any other questions okay all right so now I've told you the goals of this course let me tell you some of the non goals um, I'm not going to try to teach you how to write code or how to become a, pr a good programmer. Not because I don't think that's a good thing to know how to do. I do think it's a good thing to know how to do, but there are lots of places where you can learn that. There are lots of resources online available to tell you this you know, sort of generic advice on how to write code, how to be a good software engineer. So I'm not going to spend any time on that. We're not going to fuss over whether we're using, you know, sort of following best practice or whether we're formatting our code you know, correctly. Our interest for us, the, the, the code that we're writing is entirely a means to an end. We're interested in the mathematics, not the code. The code's just a tool to help us understand the mathematics. The other thing I'm not going to do, to even attempt to do, is give you even an overview of the four systems, the, the functionality that's in the four different computer algebra systems we're going to study. Because if I were to do so, that would be the entire week right there. The, 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 the online magma documentation, for example, this runs to about 7,000 pages, and Sage is probably longer than that. Um, so there, there's, there's vastly more out there than I can possibly discuss. I'm going to focus on some specific examples that I think are computationally interesting and particular interest uh, to number theorists and some of which also some have some historical interest the other thing I'm not going to try and teach you in this course although I hope you'll be learning a lot of this in all of the other courses is I'm not going to try you to teach you any math you may learn some new mathematics by accident as we go along or, or at least some new facts you might not have been aware of um, but just as when you're reading, you know, a, a very heavy-duty mathematics paper where you're, you know, struggling through a, a very abstract and complicated proof, there will often come a step where somebody might, where the author might say something like, and a computation shows sort of the key thing I needed for my proof to be true is actually true. and doesn't tell you anything about the details of the computation. You just accept that they've done it and that it worked. Similarly, we're going to be focused entirely on the computational details. And I will occasionally things, say things like, a theorem shows, and expect you to just take my word for it. I will provide links in the in the references I'll provide to any non-trivial facts I mention, um, but I don't want you to read them this week. Wait till the course is over to, to read them. Um, 
I know this is a difficult thing for mathematicians to do. It's kind of like, you know, shouting squirrel in a worm room full of dogs. Um, but just to give an example, uh, we will, uh, in, se in several of the algorithms we use, we'll, we'll make use of the fact that the trace of Frobenius of an elliptic curve over a finite field with Q elements has absolute value at most two times root Q. And more generally, if I replace my elliptic curve with uh, a, cur a nice curve of genus G or an abelian variety, it's similarly, its trace of Frobenius is bounded by 2G times the square root of Q. And this is a wonderful theorem with a beautiful proof, and I'm sure there are plenty in the audience now who are the dogs chasing the squirrel recalling their favorite version of that proof, but we're not going to spend any time on that. We're just going to take it as a given. We're going to instead take advantage of the fact that in this place, at this time, and in this room even, we happen to have some of the leading experts, um, not necessarily on proving that theorem, although I'm sure there are plenty of people here who are, have their favorite versions of the proof, but on actually computing those traces of Fermini very, very quickly. Um, just to mention a, a few of the names of the are people who are either here or will be here during this three, uh, these three weeks, Rene Schoff, um, Noam Elkies, uh, Karen Kedlaya, David Harvey, I think those four names are probably responsible sort of for the, either directly or indirectly, for all of the algorithm, point counting algorithms that we're going to talk about, and they're all here this three weeks. Um, so I think it's a good, a good, op, a good, that was sort of motivated my choice of topics, and I think it's a good for us to take advantage of that uh, knowledge that uh, is available to us. Okay. The other thing I'm not going to try and do, I initially had a more ambitious plan for this course, I'm not going to try to co cover all the different tools that I think might be useful to you. So there are plenty of, of computational tools out there that I, th I think are useful, and, and I'm sure I know that many of you have used some of them. Um, I'm not going to focus on, the, on the, for this week, I want to focus on the four that I think are sort of most directly targeted at number theorists. Um, but I will mention that uh, some of these other tools, in particular if your work involves a lot of commutative algebra or algebraic geometry, I would strongly encourage you to check out Macaulay 2, for example, which can do some things there that some of the tools I'm going to talk about can't do. Okay, but we're going to focus um, sort of more on number theory. Sort of my metric here was, can I verify the anaclytic class number formula or the BSD formula using this computer algebra system? If I can compute all the quantities in those two formulas, then it made it in, it made the cut, and if I can't, it didn't. So Macaulay 2 can't quite do that. All right. There are also a lot of computational tools that I'm not going to mention, other than on this slide, but that we're actually going to be using without realizing it because they're baked in to the systems that we're going to be talk about. We're going to talk about. Many of you are familiar with Sage, and you know this is one of sort of the foundational principles of, of Sage: is building the car, building, you know, putting together all these different pieces into a useful package. And so there's lots of. Um, uh, very useful software libraries and even entire computer algebra systems in their own right, like GAP, um, that are hidden under the covers, not just of Sage, but also of Oscar, one of the four systems that we're going to be talking about, and Magma as well makes use of a lot of these, a, a lot of these libra software libraries. So I don't want to overlook them, I want to make, give, give credit to them, and I encourage you to click through the links and check them out if you'd like to know more about them. Okay. So what's what I what, so now I've told you all the things I'm not we're not going to talk about. What are we going to talk about? So the four systems we're going to be looking at uh, over the next uh, five problem sessions we're going to be working with these are Perry GP, which for the sake of brevity I'm going to call Perry GP just GP. The, the, sometimes there's a distinction between GP being the the scripting language or the interactive uh, command line that you talk to, and Perry being the software library that you work with. Um, GP has been around for a long time, since the early 80s, uh, started by uh, Henri Cohen and, and Francois Dress. Um, it's an open source project that hundreds of people have contributed to, and it's under very active development today. I'm very ex I can't wait for Perry 2.14.0 to, to come out as a stable release. It's almost there. Um, but the, there are regular updates being made and new functionality being added. There's a lot of cool new stuff on, for Genus 2 curves. They did massively improved their support for modular forms a few years ago. And so there's a lot of uh, developers, uh, including I expect some of the, possibly some of the people in this room, who are uh, actively working on making that a, a bigger and better system. 
The next one we're going to work with is magma, which I think is also probably familiar to many of the people in the audience. And this is also a very mature tool that's been around for um, several decades. This was uh, started in the, in the, in the 90s. Um, by Reeb Bosma, John Cannon, and Catherine Playhouse, or at least they're the ones who wrote the paper that gets all the citations. They're certainly not the only people that were involved in um, in uh, the initial stages of the, the magma system. And this system also is still under active development. There are new features that are added on a regular basis. And um, you know we're gonna be working with a release that was just, just came out two weeks ago. Um, and here again, I should acknowledge the Simons Foundation who has made, through a very generous grant, has made uh, magma is not free software. It's, 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 uh, there is a, a sort of a, a license that needs to be paid. They're not, they're not, they're not a profit, but they cover their costs with these uh, licenses. But the Simons Foundation is uh, funded any uh, researcher associated with a U.S. educational institution or research institution can get an, a free license uh, for, for Magma to install either on their university's hardware or also on your own machine. I, I realize a lot of people aren't necessarily available, aware of this, but if you're at a, a university, you can get a copy of Magma to run on your laptop. Just go ask your IT person person for it. You may have to push them a little bit to get them to set it up for you, but it's, it, you're entitled to it. Okay. Next one we're going to talk about is Sage, which I think is the one that's most familiar, at least based on the initial survey. I think a lot of you um, have used Sage, and it's probably many of you know this. So this is a more recent system uh, introduced in 2005 by William Stein. Um, it's a, a massive open source project which has hundreds, if not thousands, of contributors, um, and it does a lot more than just number theory. I mean, William Stein is a number theorist and was an orig originally motiv very motivated in by m number theory calculations, but Sage can do all sorts of things and is used by all sorts of people for many things outside of number theory, we're going to be focusing on the number theory and arithmetic geometry functionality in SAGE. And then the last system we're going to look at is um, OSCAR, which stands for Open Source Computer Algebra Research. And this is one that I suspect is not familiar to very many people here, at least based on the initial survey. So this is a very new system. It's still not in an official production release. This is sort of in a beta. We're on version 0.9, um, but we're still, we still haven't hit version 1.0 yet. Um, this is an, also an open source project. Uh, it doesn't yet have as large a developer community as Sage does, but it's growing. Um, and there's been a lot of uh, active work um, recently. And the one thing that really distinguishes Oscar is that it's built on top of Julia, which is a very recently developed programming language. I think Julia 1.0 came out just in 2018, so it hasn't um, been around as long as Python, doesn't have as large a development community, but it can do some really cool things. And you'll get a chance to see some of those really cool things um, during the course of, uh, during this course. But the one, there, I guess there's two words of warning I should make with regard to Oscar and Julia. One is that um, Julia, being a very young language, was sort of developed in a, a radically open style where everybody on the internet could see what it did and make comments and they made changes to the language at a very early stage. Most languages are fairly, you know, sort of fully conceived before they're let loose on the world and then there maybe are minor tweaks that are made. But in, in the case of Julia, there were pretty substantial changes made. And those were recorded on the internet, as everything is these days. And what that means is that if you today go and type into Google, how do I do X in Julia, there's a more, there's a non-trivial chance that you will be led to a page that is going to give you wrong information because it's referring to a version of Julia um, in which the functionality you're interested in has actually changed since then. So the, the word of it, warning is don't believe everything you read on the internet. Go to the official Julia documentation if you want to find out some, how something works in Julia, and I've provided links in the notebook files where you can get that information. The other caveat is that Oscar, because it's still in a sort of pre-release early stage, um, it's not yet a pre-built package. So you, when, you, when you install in Julia, it takes about 20 or 30 seconds when you, from when you type in using Oscar to when Oscar is actually ready to go. 